I don't know about you, but I love things that are beautiful, stylish, and functional all at the same time. You know, it's a very Jeffersonian sort of principle. Thomas Jefferson loved function, but he also loved beauty. And that's what I've tried to do with this kitchen. This kitchen is um, used for a lot of things, and a lot of people come through here, but it has to work. And so what I've done is I've divided the kitchen really by a big island in the center, and on this side is where the heat all occurs. So cooking, you've got the stove here. In the middle of the island, you've got water. And then on the other side of the kitchen, you have cold or freeze. So hot, water, cold over there. So that's how I've broken it up. And the way this kitchen works, I wanted it big enough where it could be what I call a seven-ass kitchen, meaning I could get seven people in here and they could work side by side and they would have all these different stations around where they could work on things and have family events and friends come out here and cook. So it makes it really a lot of fun. But it has to all be beautiful too. And I've used a very simple palette here in this kitchen. The color is largely white, the appliances are white, the wood cabinets are white, the trim is white. I've got gray marble tops on the, all of the counters and so forth. And so that makes it feel very harmonious. And all of the metal is stainless steel, whether it's the appliances or the lights and so forth. So with the stove, what I have here, I have six burners, I have two stoves here with convection on one, and then what I have over here on this side for further heat is I've got a microwave that's a drawer that opens and closes like this, and then I have a warming oven right here. I can also warm across here by just flip, flip, flipping on some heat lamps where I can put food up here. So this works really well when I'm cooking and want all the hot stuff going on on this side. So come over here, for, oh, let me show you my soup. <laughs> throwing some soup together for the crew. And what I love about this is I've got a pot filler and if I'm making stock or if I'm making a big pot of stew or soup like I am today, it works out really well. Then if you come over here, I've got two sinks, uh, like a deep farm sink. Um, and I wanted to make sure that the spout was up high enough. All of the metals polished nickel uh, here and here. And this is a double sink on either side. And the washing, well, on either side, I have two dishwashers. So when we got a big group here, you get them all filled up and it really makes it handy. And on either side of this sink are two waste bins. Then on this side of the kitchen, this is where you've got refrigerator. Well, I don't know if I want to show you the inside of my refrigerator. It's like seeing the inside of my closet. You can learn a lot about somebody if you look inside their refrigerator. Anyway, I've got a refrigerator here. And then of course, here's the deep freezer, which is really important because my frozen beans were in here and that's what I'm making the soup out of. And then down here is the ice maker. So it ties into all the sort of cold and chill on this side of the, of the kitchen. And then what I have down here, I have slots for all my pots and pans. I love open shelves so I can reach and grab for those. And all the, all the pans that I would be using up here on the stove are right over here at the right hand of the stove. And here I've got a knife drawer. I can pull the knives out and chop onions or whatever I need to right here on this corner. Now, one of the things that I'm kitchen that you really find that you never have enough of and that storage space. There are cabinets up above where I have dishes that I don't use a lot, but these all below are ones where those are the everyday dishes being used. And you can see I'm kind of a white freak. Everything in here is white, white dishes, because they're just so easy and functional. And then as far as the pantry, I have my spice rack right here. And with the spice rack, what I can do is just pull it open. I've got them all in a drawer like that. And then take a look at this. This is where I keep vinegars and oils and things like this, and this is really handy. And all of these uh, elements are on a stainless steel rack, so it's really good for cleaning. And then up here I've got shelving, and I keep a little short step ladder over here in the pantry, so I'm able to pull it out and go up here and grab whatever I need. Most of my baking goods are up here, so that's roughly how the kitchen is organized. You know, the thing to think about, it doesn't matter the size kitchen you have, you really need to think about how you use the kitchen. So you've got the style, the look that you want. In this case, I wanted a classic American farm kitchen. So that's the style part of it. But from a functional standpoint, I wanted to be able to uh, work in this kitchen with great ease and have a lot of people in here, seven people, and to cook all at one time. So as you can see, that's the functional side of what, what I have going on here. And that gives you a little background into sort of the logic and how this kitchen was laid out.
Well, it's that time of year when, well, it's time to get this room really comfortable and ready to use. This is the sleeping porch, which is a very old fashioned idea. And you see this idea in certain parts of the country where, well, the summers were hot. So it's a very much a Southern idea. You also see it on the East Coast and the West Coast where you have really mild temperatures in the summer. And on the West Coast, you have mild temperatures in Southern California all the time. But the sleeping porch was used as a place to get away from the heat of the inside of the house and be able to take advantage of the breezes during the spring and the summer. And this room is really not quite as large as it might look. You see, it's only 12 feet wide and it's about 36 feet long. And so it really feels generous. And the idea about this room is for it to feel really comfy. And, uh, but what I wanna do is just describe first some of the architectural details. The floor is made of tongue and groove pine that's been painted sort of a soft green. From the floor, if you look straight up, it's a beadboard ceiling that's been painted a bird egg blue, and that's to keep insects from building nests on it like wasps and dirt daubers. Now, if you look at the north wall across here, you actually see the exterior finish of the house which is an old brick that's been lime washed. And then I have dark green shutters flanking the windows and the door down here on the west end. Now on both ends of this porch, since the prevailing winds come down the river in this direction, this entire wall, the west wall and the east wall are shuttered. And those are louvered shutters so you can close them up if there's too much wind coming this way or you can open them up if the breeze is just the way you want it. Speaking of breeze, Looking back at the ceiling, you can see I have three ceiling fans that can really stir it up, which makes it, again, a very comfortable space. Of course, the best view from the house is right up here. It's like a crow's nest, and you can see the world. You can see all the way down the river, and you can see it through this screen wire. And this is copper wire. And what I like about it is that it doesn't have an iridescence or a sheen and you can see right through it, it feels much more translucent to the eye, so uh, it doesn't distort what you see beyond. And I love being able to sit up here and watch barges go down the river, and also be able to look at the garden and listen to the fountain below. You know, this room really reflects, I think, the whole garden home idea of where you blur the lines between inside and out. Take, for instance, color, which is so important. There's some color echoes going on here. If we go back through the colors of the architecture of this outdoor room, you have the pale green floor, you have the white trim, you have the dark green with the shutters, and then you have the pale blue ceiling and the soft yellow walls. Well, I've echoed that in the furnishings that are out here. The side tables are dark green. Some of the rockers that are in wicker are done in pale green, and even the beds are done white with coverlets that are blue, and the pillows are white, blue, and green. And hey, this stuff really lasts. This is a sombrella indoor-outdoor fabric. Looks like it would be something you would use inside the home, but this has been out here for three years, and it has held up beautifully. And the rugs as well, they're indoor-outdoor rugs. And I have all of the little comfort creatures around, a lamp, a lantern here with candles, house plants, and even magazines, as well as a tray of refreshments for my friends to drink. So even though it's called a sleeping porch, it doesn't mean you have to come out here and sleep. This little corner or nook is a perfect place to just sort of kick back and relax. And I cannot tell you how important house plants are, particularly in the summer, to make a place feel really cozy and wonderful. Plus, it does your house plants a lot of good to get them outside for what I call summer camp. Now come down here at the other end because I want to show you the aspect of this room that always grabs everyone's attention. This tub really is one of the most comforting aspects of this entire house, and particularly this room. You can fill it up with warm water, bubble bath, a little rubber ducky, have a glass of wine, and just kick back and watch the world go by. What I do is keep a bath mat out here. This old step ladder serves as a great place to put extra towels and soap and shampoo and so forth. And on a practical note, the plumbing is actually, it's run under the floor and there's a shutoff valve right behind this shutter where we can turn the water off in the winter so we don't get a problem with 
freezing pipes breaking and so forth. So if you do this and you have freezing temperatures in your part of the world, you want to make sure you have that little safety valve in place. Well, welcome to the mud room. It has certainly transformed. If you remember, several months ago, it was really a disaster. Well, it wasn't a disaster. They were just working at it very methodically. And it's a great place for me to bring flowers in from the garden. And what I particularly love is this really deep sink. Mm, these iris are incredible. I wish you could smell them. And you can set them down in here. And I like it because it's cool and dark in here, which will help keep the flowers lasting uh, much longer. Now this sink I'm very proud of. This is a farm sink that a friend of mine who's a specialist in stone actually installed and it's made of soapstone. But if you've ever used soapstone you know that it has to be cared for a certain way. Terry Geta and his wife Kathy not only designed and built the sink and installed it but Terry also helped me understand what I need to do to take care of it. Each job um, that we do, we look at it as an individual. Marble, granite, and limestones really stand the test of time because of the quality of the material. You can hone the material, which will take the high shine off, the high polish, give it more of a satin finish. One of the unique things of soapstone is its ability to last and its ability to be freshened up every time you want it to look like a new surface. One of the reasons we use mineral oil for soapstone is because is give it a whole new look every 30 days if that's something you want to do. And it can make such a dramatic difference on the beauty of the stone. It's not going to make it look shiny as it will bring out the color of the stone. So you can see the dramatic difference between using oil and not using oil. Natural light brings a lovely ambience to any room. And while large windows can pose a problem when it comes to sun exposure and reduce privacy, window treatments can often provide the perfect solution. Zach Gibbs shows us how they can add both function and beauty to your home. Well, Zach, I am so pleased with the transition these draperies have made in the room. They look fantastic. Are, are you happy with them? Oh, absolutely. The outcome's great. Well, you know, when we started, I, I designed those valances that were mounted at the upper part of the window, and I always thought, well, it'd be nice to have some, some drapery panels. The fabrics you chose couldn't have fit the room better. Well, we just did an echo, you know, off of that stripe on the valance, and then chose one of your linen samples, which was a great fit. It's a soft color, so it doesn't overwhelm the room, given the amount of fabric for these panels, but it works perfectly with the valances, definitely. So see, you got the shears mounted as well. They really soften the light coming into the room. Absolutely. The dual treatments that you selected uh, serve a great functionality purpose in this room. During the day when the sun's really beaming in, keep the shears closed, protects your floor, furniture, artwork from fading, filters out the sun so it's not glaring if you're sitting here with friends. With these, we did a uh, privacy liner so the natural light can still filter in to uh, still let the natural linen texture show. We chose to give these drapery panels a slight break on the floor, a slight puddle, just to kind of blend into the more traditional setting. Yeah. That allows the drapery to flare out a little bit, adding a little bit of volume or bulk to it. For more of a contemporary feel, usually we recommend going straight to the floor or just off the floor to keep a straight line I see. Uh, with it's the drapery really panels. Clean line with the floor. Exactly. And so if someone wants to add new window treatments, what would be the first steps? 
I always suggest first getting samples, hopping online, getting free samples, just to see how the material feels and the colors look. So you really should see it and hold it. Absolutely, hold it up to your walls, hold it up to the paint surrounding the area and your furniture. From there, any functionality questions, pleat style questions, etc. give a salesperson a call to really guide you through because each application does have different features to it. And lastly, get a great installer. Measure twice, install once, <laughs> right. I think is the saying. Yes. Um, but a good measurement and a good install really completes the project, which we captured here. Well, Zach, these are a beautiful addition to the room, and thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Hey, if you love this video, make sure you comment and subscribe below.